In August of AD 79, Mount Vesuvius erupted. Experts estimate it took about 15 minutes before 2,000 people in Pompeii were overcome and killed by a giant hot cloud of toxic gas and volcanic ash. The eruption of Vesuvius happened suddenly, even surprisingly, but history and hindsight tell us warning signs were given. Leading up to that fateful day, Pompeii had experienced a series of tremors. Then the mountain began to make groaning noises. The sea around the Bay of Naples was reported to have become so hot in places that the water boiled. These harbingers of doom were present in advance, but largely ignored. What happens when warnings go unheeded? When signs are ignored? Usually bad things. When we ignore the warnings that our bodies give us. We're usually allowing disease to progress unchecked. When we ignore the wrong way or the one-way signs that we see on the interstate, it can lead to serious and sometimes fatal accidents. When we dismiss the signs from nature, red skies in the morning, gathering clouds on the horizon, of the ocean, groaning noises from a previously volcanic mountain. Mass casualties can ensue. And when we turn a blind eye to the warnings found in God's word, the worst of all possible outcomes is possible. <coughs> Death, condemnation, separation from God, eternal misery. In our text from Malachi today, the final chapter of this little book, the Lord continues with and punctuates the warnings he's been given throughout. So if you have a copy of God's Word with you this morning, I'd ask you to turn with me to the book of Malachi in chapter 4. Malachi is an easy one to find. If you haven't been going through this series with us, I encourage you to find Matthew and then go left real quick. You will find Malachi. Last book in the Old Testament is easy to find because we can easily find the New Testament. We're in Malachi chapter 4. I'm going to read for you verses 1 through 6. Malachi 4, 1 through 6, so the majority of our time is going to be spent in the first three. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble. The day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. You shall go out leaping like calves from the stall, and you shall tread down the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord of hosts. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the statutes and rules that I commanded him at Horeb for all Israel. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. Our Father, as we come for your word this morning, we do ask for a special grace to be able to attend to what it is that you want to say to us. We would admit to you, Lord, that we are sometimes easily distracted and our minds can wander, and yet there are no words more important ever uttered or written than those contained in your Holy Scripture. Help us then to hear them and help us where they might apply to apply them. We ask in Christ's name for his glory, our good. Amen. Well, you might recall from the beginning of our study in this little book that Malachi's prophecy is described in the first verse uh, of the first chapter as an oracle, which is a word that also can be translated burden, something that is weighty. 
And now we've been working our way through this book for many weeks. Now I think you, you have seen and you had heard why Malachi would describe this book as a burden. Why the description fits so well. The burden on the prophet is in part due to the seriousness of the message that he's bringing. The severity of it. The solemnity of it. Malachi delivers heavy, heavy words. And, and I would imagine you have felt some of the heaviness of these words as we have studied them together. So the burden of Malachi is this weighty message that he is called upon by God to bring to the people. That's part of the burden, and another part is also the, the weight that the message has on the messenger, on what it, the toll it takes on, on a fellow like Malachi. Because it is so much easier, it is so much more fun, I think you would agree, to be the bearer of good news, to be the, the one who brings the good news and, and talks about things that are going well and, and celebrates all that is going right. That is more fun than having to do what Malachi has to do. But the sad fact is that good news, at least in terms of the behavior and the disposition toward God of the people of Judah at this time, good news in Israel is actually quite scant. So Malachi usually speaks, and I, I know you've noticed this, about what's gone wrong, about what is spiritually awry among the people. They have transgressed the covenant and about what they could expect because of their poor behavior and their unwillingness to return to the Lord. These can be really hard words to hear. They can be hard words to speak. And none more so than the final six verses that bring this book to a close. They are, in my mind at least, some of the most direct, the most somber, and the most fearsome of all the prophetic words to this point. So as we pick up in chapter 4, we see that it really is a continuation of chapter 3. And we dealt with this last week. God's answer to the people's assertion that it didn't really matter how they related to him. Uh, that it, it was vain to serve the Lord, they thought. There was no prophet in it. And there's no distinction between the righteous and the unrighteous in the end. As chapter 3 concludes, God promises hear, his hearers that a day is coming when the distinction between the righteous and the unrighteous will actually come into focus and be completely obvious to everyone. And chapter 4 just continues this theme, this string of an idea. For behold, a day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble. Now remember the people of Judah had been watching the prosperity of the wicked. They had concluded that God was blessing them. And, and they thought that God should have been cutting them down. And the people wanted to see the immediate judgment of God on these people just land on them. But God had chosen not to bring his immediate judgment on them, even though they were sinning and doing wrong. We know that when God refrains from immediate judgment, that he's not turning a blind eye to sin, that he's not ignoring it, that it's not something that he would just dismiss casually or pretend doesn't exist. But what God is doing in those moments when he doesn't bring his immediate judgment is he's leaving, leaving room for repentance. He's leaving room for change. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, as Bob has prayed. So God does very often mercifully delay his judgment. However, if and when he chooses, he will initiate judgment. And everyone who remains in their sin at that time, they will pay the price for their unbelief. And they will pay the price for their godlessness. That time, God says, will come. The day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. The imagery that we have here is the imagery of fire. Malachi has spoken about fire previously in this book, in chapter 3, talking about God. He is like a refiner's fire. But this fire is different. 
Because here in Malachi 4, the prophet's not writing about the presence of the Lord to preserve his people or the presence of the Lord to purify his people. He's speaking about the presence of God in judgment to destroy those who are not his people. Here God is not a refining fire, he is a consuming fire. And that is exactly the description of God that we find in Deuteronomy 4.24, in Deuteronomy 9.3, in Isaiah 33, 14, in Hebrews 12, 29, our God is a consuming fire. It is an aspect of God that we'd mostly rather not dig too deep into, a, a part of him that we would rather not face if we could avoid it. And he's speaking now in Malachi of a day that is coming that we would rather believe is not, that it's not going to come. But this is how it will be when, when God comes, when he confronts the rebellion of the world, when he judges it definitively. That's what Malachi is saying. This day is not only imminent, this day is necessary. As commentator John McKay writes, the God of holiness and truth cannot endure rebellion against himself indefinitely. That day will burn like a furnace. It will burn with God's divine anger. A wrath that is righteous and a wrath that is just and a wrath that every human being deserves. That day will initiate the final separation of the saved and the lost. Jesus spoke of it this way. His words recorded in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 13, verses 49 and 50. So it will be at the close of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Malachi says that all the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble. That everyone who proudly resists the Lord, everyone who does not honor him as God, everyone choosing to stay on a pathway of sin will be like the dried up remains of the crops left on the ground after harvest, cut down, brittle, straw, in the path of intense flames, what chance would they have? The great and dreadful day of the Lord will set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. There will be no escaping the consuming fire of God against the ungodly on that day. Listen to these words from the book of Job, describing the fate of the one who doesn't know God. His roots dry up beneath, and his branches wither above. His memory perishes from the earth, and he has no name in the street. He is thrust from light into darkness and driven out of the world. He has no posterity or progeny among his people, and no survivor where he used to live. They of the west are appalled at this day, and horror seizes them of the east. Surely such are the dwellings of the unrighteous. Such is the place of him who knows not God. This is the fate of those who do not know God. And yet the tragedy here is that God can be known. He desires to be known. He makes himself known. He pleads with his creation to know him, to turn to him to return to him. And he warns us all of what will come of us if we don't. And still, despite God wanting to be known, despite God making himself known, despite God inviting to be him, you to know him, many will not know God. And those who resist all his invitations, the scripture teaches, will come to destruction. Whatever power they may have had in this life will be helpless against the flames. Whatever influence they may have wielded in this life will melt away. Whatever riches they may have had and depended upon in this life will evaporate in the intense heat. All that the wicked enjoy in their godlessness, all that the citizens of Judah were at the time envious of, all that looked like blessing for those who never feared the Lord, it will come to nothing and it will count as nothing but kindling, kindling on that day when the Lord consumes it 
and leaves no trace behind. Neither root nor branch remains. The God of righteousness will judge those who do not fear him. And they will become as ashes. That is an outcome, one outcome, of a great and dreadful day, the day of the Lord, the inevitable comeuppance of the ungodly. And there is another outcome that Malachi speaks of. Chapter 4, verse 2, But for you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. For you who fear my name. So there's one outcome for those who don't fear my name. There's another. The Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in its wings. Is there profit in serving the Lord? The people are saying no. Is it vain to serve the Lord? The people are saying yes. The truth is this verse tells us otherwise. There is profit in serving the Lord. It is not vain to give your life to God. So Malachi moves us from the imagery of a consuming fire to that of a rising sun. And a rising sun brings hope. I don't know if you've ever had that that distinct privilege of working the night shift. But if you have, you know how wonderful it is to see the sun peak over the horizon when you just about had all you can take and you're ready to nod off, the sun comes up. And as the sun rises, the sun brings hope to you. Hope that you can stay awake for the rest of your shift. (laughs) But a rising sun brings hope for every day, doesn't it? Sorrow lasts for a night, the scripture tells us, but joy comes in the morning. Life can be hard, life can be unjust, life can be unfair, it can be desperate even and dark, but it won't always be this way. That's what we're being taught. The rising sun brings light to drive away the darkness of night, and its rays bring warmth. This is a picture of restoration, the warmth. Now we're entering that season uh, in our region where the sun seems to lose its warmth and get ready for a few months of just cold. But then there's that day, usually sometime in March. Not that odd one in February where it turns 60 and everybody gets excited and we know better. The one at the end of March, or maybe the beginning of April, where you get a true sense there is warmth in the sun. But this warmth is going to stay. And it's going to get warmer and better and better and warmer. Yes, amen. That's the picture of hope, of warmth, of comfort, of restoration. There's an an acknowledgement here that we all know that life is broken and it is in need of fixing. Sin has permeated every nook and cranny of human existence. It has corrupted all of it, all of creation. Nothing in this world can evade sin's crippling effects. No body, no relationship, no institution, No government, but sin and its effects do not have the last word. Deliverance is coming. Malachi promises the sun of righteousness will rise. A new day will dawn. The rising of this sun, this new day, was spoken of by Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist. He prophesied over his infant boy, Luke chapter 1. Verses 76 to 79. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High. For you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people and the forgiveness of their sins. Because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high, to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. Could Zechariah have known what he was talking about in those moments? Could he have known the depth and the breadth, the width of the ministry of the coming Christ? 
the, the light that shines into the darkness. John the Baptist is going to have the privilege of preparing the way for the one who's going to come and drive out the darkness, for the one who's going to come and through his perfect life, death, and resurrection overcome the power of death for all of us who call on his name. Could he have known? Oh, I can't imagine it, but the Spirit moved him to say these things. There's going to come a time when the sun will rise. It was spoken of by Jeremiah, too. Jeremiah 23, 5 and 6. Behold, said Jeremiah, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely, and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In, the day, in, the, in his days Judah will be saved, Israel will dwell securely, and this is the name by which he will be called, the Lord is our righteousness. The Lord is our righteousness. How will he make all these things come to pass? He will be our righteousness. And you know what? He will give his righteousness to those who call on him for it. The Lord is our righteousness. We're not righteous in and of ourselves, but we have a good God. The sun's going to rise. Hope is coming. We see this in the advent of Christ. In the first coming of Christ, we'll see it consummated in the sick. We'll see it fulfilled in the second. Malachi looks forward to a day when the sun will rise with healing in its wings. And that healing that is promised is, is promised for the godly and is the, the exact opposite of the, uh, the disaster, the trouble, the destruction that is promised for the ungodly. The light of God is coming. It's going to reveal truth. It will vindicate those who are his and those who love him. And those who fear the Lord, they will not be consumed. They will be saved. They will be secure in the shadow of his wings. When God comes on that day, his people will rejoice. Malachi says, you shall go out leaping like calves from the stall. Leaping like calves from the stall. That's what it's going to be like. I don't dance. <laughs> but I will dance on that day. Amen? Amen. Yes, because you won't be able to help it. Are you do Listen, do you well, I'm going to dance at your wedding. Yes, I am, Lindsay Bland. I already said I would. I'm going to put together some special moves, but let's not get distracted. I know what you're thinking. We're not farmers. Do we know what a calf looks like? When it leaps from the stall, if you don't know, if you haven't seen this, I seriously encourage you today, look it up on the internet and enjoy the show. <laughs> because it's the sweetest thing to see that little calf that finally leaves the stall where he's been all winter and goes into a pasture that he has no idea how awesome it is. And the only thing he can do is bounce around on all four feet and kick his hind legs in the air and run in circles and run and run because of the exultant joy that this little creature has. That's going to be what it's going to be like. You shall go out as calves from the stall, the, the picture of elation, the picture of liberation, a picture of freedom, a picture of celebration. That's how it's going to be for those who know Jesus when Jesus comes back. That's how it's going to be for the godly. And the opposite is true for those who don't know him. It will be a day of terror. It will be a day of fury for the godless. The faithful, who, who through life have been stepped on and stepped over, Malachi says. In the end, they're going to be the ones dancing. In the end, they're going to be the, the ones left standing. What a reversal that God has in mind here. And what a reversal for us to keep in mind. No matter how hard life is and how hard it can be and how oppressed we might feel or unfairly or unjustly we may be treated, there is coming a day of vindication. What a reversal. What a promise. Verse 3, And you shall tread down the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord of hosts. You shall tread down the wicked. I get that. I, I, I read that. I think I can't see us uh, gloating over the wicked in this way. But there will be no choice but to tread down the wicked, according to what Malachi has said. 
because there'll be nothing but ashes on the ground. Understand that's what he's talking about. This is a victory parade that, that Malachi is talking about. The victory parade of a conquering king. The victory parade, a procession of a triumphal ar army. The enemies have been consumed by the Lord's fiery judgment. Nothing of those who loomed large and powerful remains but powder and residue on the ground. And those made righteous by faith will walk on it. On that great and dreadful coming day of the Lord when the distinction between the righteous and the unrighteous will be forever plain to all, the proud will be humble. The humble will be exalted. Malachi could hardly draw a more vivid contrast between two eventual fates. Those who fear the Lord, what happens to those who fear the Lord, and th what happens to those who will not fear the Lord. Which makes this passage, like so many other passages in the Bible, reminding us in simplest terms there are really two ways to live. You either accept the Lord or you reject him. He is your Lord or he's not. There's no middle ground. We, we look for that middle ground. We look for that neutral ground. We look for that place where we can say, well, I'm not, I'm not really for God, but I'm not against him, and maybe that'll count for something in the end. That is not how it works, and that is not what the Bible teaches, and anybody that lets you believe that is not being kind to you. The Scripture teaches two ways to live, and the Scripture teaches two outcomes for the ways that you choose to live in relationship to God. In fact, I'd like you to take a look around you this morning for just a second, and I'm serious. Take a look around. You see some friendly faces? You see some faces you don't know? Yeah. Everybody here is an eternal soul. Every single one. I want you to comp contemplate this. Every single one of us, without exception, will either be eternally saved or eternally condemned. Just months before the end of his brief life, the Scottish minister, Robert Murray McShane, wrote in his journal. He said, as I am, was walking in the fields, the thought came over me with almost overwhelming power that every one of my flock must soon be in heaven or hell. Oh, how I wished that I had a tongue like thunder that I might make all hear or that I had a frame like iron, that I might visit every one and say, escape for thy life. Heaven or hell, that is what the Bible teaches. This is what the Bible warns about. Indeed, the words of Scripture are all the warnings one needs to know what to do. According to the parable that Don read, the parable of Lazarus and the rich man. The rich man finds himself in hell not because he's rich, but because he has lived indifferently to God and in disbelief of God. In this life, he stepped over the people that God would have us care for. And having lived for himself and not for the Lord in this world, he realized too late after he died that this world is not all there is. And being unable to change his fate after death, he pled with Father Abraham to warn his family. He asked that someone be sent to tell them. And what is the reply that he receives? They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. Basically what God says is the warning has already been given. The word of God is all one needs in order to know the eternal consequences of belief and unbelief. A day of judgment is coming. When it does come, will, will you find comfort in the afterlife? Like the poor man Lazarus? 
or will you find torment? Like the rich man whose name is lost to history. It will be a great day for those who love God. It will be a dreadful day for those who don't. Those who love God will dance. And those who don't will face his fire. Some will know the bliss of eternity in heaven. Others will know the agony of eternity in hell. Through the ages, many have been criticized for preaching this so plainly. Even though the Bible is plain, and like I, I, like I say, hey, don't blame me, I didn't make it up. I'm just the messenger. This is the message. The charge leveled against some of us preachers at times for talking like this is fear-mongering. But that is not a fair charge. Because the definition of fear-mongering, according to the Cambridge Dictionary, is the action of intentionally trying to make people afraid of something when this is not necessary or reasonable. So, without a doubt, many preachers are guilty of the first part here. Trying to make people afraid of something. Not going to apologize for trying to make anybody fear hell. Especially when there's such a wonderful alternative available. So yes, we do that. Because God does that. Because God's word does that. The first part is true. Trying to make somebody afraid of something. In this case, hell. But the second part does not apply. Trying to instill fear because it's not necessary or reasonable. God places these warnings in his word because judgment is coming. And because evasive action, avoiding death, avoiding destruction, avoiding eternal separation from him is exactly necessary and is exactly reasonable. Listen, if anybody had run through the streets of Pompeii telling everyone to evacuate because the mountain is going to blow, they would not have been accused of fear-mongering. It would have been a public service. It would have been necessary and reasonable. So it is the kindness of God, no matter how unpleasant it is from time to time, to read or hear of these things, to tell us what is surely ahead. It is the kindness of God to warn us of judgment so that we might be, if we are not, so that we might be saved, which is what God wants for us, to be saved. How is one saved? Well, lucky for you, you have a bulletin insert this morning. Some of you have noticed it already, and I want to walk through it with you. Also, I want to share just a passage, a quick passage with you from Hebrews chapter 1 this morning because we're studying Malachi. Malachi is written 400 years before Jesus comes on the scene. And Malachi is talking about returning to God and about following the law and following the prophets. And Malachi is himself a prophet trying to draw people to him, to the Lord. But listen to what Hebrews says so that we get the proper context. Because we have a lot more information than the people in Malachi's day had. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1. Long ago, at many times, and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son 
whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. After making purification for sins, after coming into this world living a sinless life, undeserving of death but choosing the cross, hanging there with his bloodshed, the propitiation, the atonement for undeserving humanity, having made that available so that you no longer have to pay the debt of your sin because Jesus has paid it, the writer of Hebrews says, he sat down. Like there. Done. Now it's up to you. What will you do with what Jesus has done? That's the context for understanding how to get saved. If you're wondering how to be saved, the first thing to do is understand what salvation is. I think one of those questions comes up. Saved from what? Saved from the wrath of God. <coughs> saved from eternal judgment. Saved from having to stand before the Lord on your merits alone. Saved from condemnation. Salvation is the work of God to redeem, which is a word in the Bible that means to buy back our souls, which have been captured by sin and are condemned without his help. Salvation is recreating our hearts so that we can love the things that God loves and we can hate the things that God hates. Because usually we, in our natural state, we have that backwards. Salvation is re redirecting our lives towards serving and honoring God instead of just seeking to serve and honor ourselves. Salvation is only possible because in his love God did not leave us in our condemned state, but through Jesus took the punishment himself for our wrongdoing. Ephesians 2, 1 to 10 summarizes this and makes it clear that we are not simply misguided, but in fact dead in our sin apart from the work of God. That God did not need to save us, but he did so because of his mercy and great love for us. That the work of Christ is an act of grace. That is unmerited favor, a gift. We couldn't earn it through any effort of our own. He simply loves us and wants to save us. That in being made new through the work of Jesus, we are ready to do good works as a result of our salvation, not the means of it. We are inspired to live because of God's grace. We're not earning our salvation. And so then if God has done all this, does it mean that we are saved automatically? No. The Bible is clear that we have a part to play in this, that our part is to believe. And that doesn't mean simply that we like what the Bible has to say or that we would even acknowledge the existence of a God. The devil knows him. But that in our deepest heart of hearts, we would confess our sin. Recognize that in our thoughts, attitudes, words, and actions, we have broken God's perfect law, his wonderful design for mankind. To acknowledge the only way for us to be saved is for God to make a way for us and to trust wholly that this is what he did with Jesus. Jesus, his son, who is God, came and lived that sinless life that we couldn't. Died as a sacrifice for us, was buried and rose again, is seated in heaven, the rightful king of all creation. And accept that Jesus died for you. And that he wants you to respond in gratitude to the offer of a new life that his resurrection makes possible. And surrender our lives wholly and completely to God. Committing to learn and follow him as revealed in Christ. Relying on the power of his Holy Spirit's presence in our lives to change us. From who we are into a people who would serve him and show the world his glory. And all we are and all we do. Are you saved? Or do you want to be saved? Week after week after week in this place from this pulpit. We encourage you to respond to the Lord. And sometimes, honestly, I don't think we tell you how. This tells you how. 
All you have to do is bow your head and ask Christ into your life. Choose to live for him. And you'll be with us, whatever this is going to look like, leaping like calves from the stall when Jesus comes back. The alternative is nothing you would ever want to face and nothing we want anyone ever to face. Why would you choose hell when heaven, through Christ, is offered to you? If this is something you would like to do, it says first tell God and then tell a friend. And I encourage you to do that and not wait. If you would like to be saved, then pray to the Lord to save you and tell somebody about it. And if you would be so kind as to tell me or any one of our elders that are here, could you guys stand up? At least, so you got Steve, you got Chris in the back, you got Tim, you got Bob. Connect with somebody here if you make a decision that today you want to be saved. You would never want to face a dreadful day of the Lord. You want it to be a great day. Let's pray. Our Father, we call upon you for your mercy and grace in our lives. We thank you for the warnings that you give us, and we know they are true. And we don't know when this stuff is going to happen. But we would say, we're reading the rest of your word, that it looks like it's going to happen sooner rather than later. So help us never to delay, but to surrender our lives in meaningful service to you all day, every day. Have your way in this place. Have your way in our lives. Overcome our resistance to you. Meet us with an irresistible grace. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.